Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Buy Right, our webinar this morning on acquisitions. Uh, my name is Kevin Uppel, and I'm the chairman of Avondale Corporate. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be focusing on strategic acquisitions, really not the how of doing acquisitions. We think that's broadly understood, the technicalities, although we can, of course, take questions on that if needs be, but, but the why. Uh, what companies should we be buying and, and why? And how do they fit our strategy to create better businesses? So very much the, the how and not the why. Uh, for those of you who don't know Avondale, uh, we're emerging mid-market specialists. Um, we do M&A work helping people buy and sell companies, enterprise value, typically two to 50 million. So, you know, uh, we call it the emerging mid-market or you could call it the very successful end of the SME market. Um, and we'll be sharing some of our experiences of that today. Um, I'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes, just get some of the theory across, um, and then I'm going to be joined by my colleague Simon. Simon Baldwin's one of our lead M&A advisors, been doing it uh, over 20 years uh, and helped over 200 people buy and sell companies. So, uh, you know, significant experience of what people do right and what they do wrong, and hopefully we can share some of that today. We will be recording the webinar. Um, so please share it with colleagues, etc., and and request if you don't get a copy of the record. Um, after we've talked, we'll be inviting questions as well. These sessions only really work if we get the questions interactive. So please, please, please fire questions as you go. So as I say, today is about the why, not how. Um, obviously, acquisitions. We need to talk about valuations. Uh, value is always a key point in people's minds. If, if, you, if you overpay, then you won't be buying well. But you know, we think that theory is broadly understood. Typically, EBITDA multiples are, uh, and price earnings multiples are the way to value companies, debt-free, cash-free. In the current market, we're not seeing material changes to those multiples. Uh, what we are seeing is a slight increase in deferred payments, uh, picking up where bank debt is falling off because of the cost of bank debt. Um, at the big end, uh, and by that, I think the 50 million to, to billion transaction, there is a slow up on transaction volumes, but we're currently not seeing that uh, despite the, 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 you know, the increased cost of debt. But say, today is not about the how, it's about the why and strategic acquisitions. Um, now for us, we talk about the four corners of M&A when we talk about acquisitions and we talk about how we profile buyers around that. So the four corners of M&A are economies of scale, synergy, shareholder value, and, and the fourth corner, positive disruption, uh, which is actually probably where we see the best deals. And so in a way, today we're focusing on, on, on that positive disruption. But the fundamentals are strategic acquisitions happen, particularly with trade buyers, when you're really clear on who you should buy and why and how they fit. And I suppose the argument, having been doing this for 25 years and seeing some of the mistakes and, uh, and some of the great successes that people make, often it's because people just simply aren't clear on who they are and what their strategy is. And therefore uh, they, they, you know, they buy incorrectly. I think if I'm really honest, I, I believe Elon Musk has bought wrong when he bought Twitter, uh, couldn't help himself, you know, had to have a digital asset. But the reality is, I don't think it's his core skill set, and I think he's too late to the party, and I think he bought the wrong brand. Time will tell. But um, I think it's just a lack of clarity. That's a very expensive acquisition, although for him, probably small change against the Tesla value. But, but the, the clear point for trade buyers is you've got to look at yourselves before you rush out and start looking at, at, at buyers. And even if you're being opportunistic and waiting for what comes on the market, being really clear what your business model is and where your business is going, and in particular, what your future customers are going to want. Now, of course, that's difficult. Um, strategy is, I liken it to chess, it's thinking four moves ahead, whereas planning is, is playing only one move ahead. Uh, and thinking four moves ahead is, is really difficult. But as a toolkit, one of the things that uh, uh, we formulated in our strategy practice is, is this idea here, and we call it the line of probability, but, um, and it's really difficult to guess what your future customers are going to want. But if you look back over the last five years, 
at the big data. The big data is what's happening in your sector. So you need to take time out to research what's happening in your sector. You know, what are your competitors doing? What other service offerings have they added? Um, where are they diversifying? What are the parallel sectors? What are the comparable sectors to your, your business and what's happened in the last five years within those? But also the micro data is what, what is your data telling you? Uh, are, are your customers getting older? Are they getting poor? Are they getting richer? What are the changes you're seeing within the database? Is your life cycle of customers increasing, decreasing? And that helps you understand the trends in your business. Then we've got some hope trying to assess what the future trends are. Now, it's not always possible. If you talk about strategic acquisitions, I like to share the two biggest disasters as far as I, I can see in, in history, really, uh, in, in modern capitalism. One, um, IBM had Microsoft in their hands. They just didn't think, think that the uh, PC was the future. And for me, the biggest reason that that happens is that the management who are running those businesses are employed to manage those businesses for the status quo. We want managers to have reliability, but actually positive disruption is actually all about considering competing yourself with yourself as well. Another great example of a failed acquisition opportunity. Um, when uh, Netflix went to talk to Blockbusters, Blockbusters, the video high store people, Netflix, this funny little new streaming service, they could have bought it for 50 million. Uh, and I have it on authority that the uh, managing director of Blockbusters smiled wryly and laughed. They just didn't get it. But actually, that's the danger. The danger is we're so entrenched in our own business model and what's happening today, we get blindsided by the future. And acquisitions are a really good way of offsetting that. Now, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but if I, if I, if I were to play at the moment, you know, where would I be looking, for example, to buy shares? We're all talking about AI being the end of mankind. It's not, but I'll tell you what, I'd want to invest in cybersecurity because you can see that if you get AI involved in um, basically pulling fraud, you'll, you will end up with computer fighting computer uh, uh, and the coders will be the best, probably the biggest threat to AI is that in fact our, our financial systems. So, so actually investing in cybersecurity would be a good uh, uh, place for, for investing in the future if we're looking at this positive disruption. So what is your business model? Where are you strong and weak today? What are your future customer going to want? What are the trends? And how do we buy against that? And that's some of the theory in terms of strategic acquisitions. And, and I sort of translate that to, to, to where we've seen buyers going wrong over the years. And so if we bring Simon in to, to, to explore some of this with some more actual sort of case studies as well. But I think the big one for us is because people don't look at their own business model and do that strengths and weaknesses planning and, and try and under, identify the trends. They're out there uh, talking to buy, uh, sellers and they're not clear which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. And therefore, consequently, they don't really know how to value them. But also, and probably the biggest thing, lack of focus, talking to too many. Um, uh, for us, this is about actually getting clear who you should be going to target to acquire and then making sure you talk to them on an ongoing basis. Because most people aren't quite ready to do a sale yet. You know, it may be now, it may be in five years. Um, so actually, the buyers that win are those who sweetheart their potential targets over a period of time. So when a no today turns into a I actually had, you know, poor health diagnosis, uh, change of lifestyle, circumstances, a yes tomorrow, you're the buyer they, they think about. But if you're trying to talk to 100 or 200 people, you can't do that. So get clear on who you need to buy and why against your business model, and then go sniper attack and target the actual people that you should be looking to buy. And within that sweetheart, and what we're also looking for, because many acquisitions fail on culture. This is well understood. Culture fundamentally could be put down to people and it could be put down to people thinking differently. There's a lot of talk about culture and organisations, but for us, it's actually about doing, if you like, due diligence on the way the organisation you're targeting thinks. What are their values and beliefs? 
It's not about whether they've got a cool office or whether they've got open next year. In fact, probably everyone has these days post-COVID. It's more, how do they make decisions? Is it autocratic? Is it democratic? And how strong are their belief systems? And how does that align with you to create that fit? Because if, if you haven't got at least, say, three out of those, instead of all, if you get all five, you've got real cultural fit. But if you haven't got three, you're not going to get on. And in fact, what happens is you get brain drain of the senior team. And then, of course, you've overpaid for the acquisition because the value starts to dissipate from the business. So a lot of uh, uh, work there when you're looking at targets and thinking about the people and how they think and how that's going to fit you and your organization and the way you think. We also, of course, see the classic, you know, the acquisition is actually a good target. Everybody's really busy. They don't put enough time into thinking about what the future business plan is. Uh, the due diligence gets focused, over focus on commercial and legal, uh, and then the integration of business plan falls to, falls to pop in terms of actually when, you, when you've done the deal. So, so that, of course, is a problem. Even if you've got the right target, mishandling the, 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 the integration later. From a value perspective, we've talked about this. This is not a talk today on valuations. Um, we've, we've got webinars on that. If you want to look on our website, please look. We've got guides. If you want to look, please download. Um, this is about how we get strategy right. And, and for me on values, it's actually, again, about understanding who's controlling this within the organization. Um, I sort of make a joke. You know, the, the CEO is navigating the rivers of cash ahead of the market. The general manager is running the business for reliability and the FD, who's often in charge of the acquisitions, is tight and they're absolutely certain that not a penny goes out the wrong way. Now, how do you pull all three of those elements in when you're doing an acquisition to create alignment? Because in some respects, you know, one's a dreamer, one's a reliability person and one's a bean counter and they all think very, very differently. And if you have any one of those fully in charge, then it will probably go wrong because the finance team will pull back because they don't like the valuation. The general manager will pull back because they don't get, don't get the positive disruption. And the CEO, if he's too far ahead and head in the clouds, if you like, the dreamer will miss the specifics about how they can tie in the integration um, and pull in the culture to make the deal happen. So that's a, a really important thing. Again, come back to know yourself before you presume to buy others. I think deal fever is an interesting one. Um, you know, we, we put a lot of work into finding the targets. We may go out and shortlist those targets, uh, do the door knocking, sweetheart, and get the right deal, uh, get it all agreed. Um, and then as we're going through the deal, uh, we get caught up in the deal and we forget to ask, the question which you've got to ask till you sign does it fit are we doing the right thing um but you get so carried away that you are doing the deal and this is your game changer that you forget to ask that question at the final point uh, and one of the drivers to also deals falling over even when you've got them agreed is deal fatigue um and for us that is where i think the legals and the financials uh, uh overrun and we've got one at the moment where the change of control clauses, for example, with the bank. Oh, my God. The bank don't know what they're doing. I don't know who the legal team are at their end, but, you know, we are really struggling with it. Uh, it is difficult, but I, I, I'm afraid it's not joined up. And, and everyone's getting really irritated, and then they forget why they're trying to do the deal in the first place. So strategic acquisitions, we've also got to look for where those tension points are once we've agreed a deal in terms of making sure that we stay on track. I think um, one of the other points that we're seeing in the marketplace, uh, due diligence uh, is, has shifted, it's shifted in a few areas. Um, and, 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 and for us, again, I think, you know, the world we live in is a, a corporate compliance world uh, and there's an awful lot of legislation out there. Um, and actually, for buyers, because the market is so volatile, risk has increased. Uh, and I think from that perspective, everyone's a little bit nervous. And by nature, when you're nervous, you tend to look more at the compliance. Uh, but the danger here is that the due diligence is starting to overfocus on purely the financial and legal. Whereas in reality, 
as ever with a strategic acquisition, the product set, the customer set, the team, the operational efficiency, the IT sector, every business is a, is, is a tech business. Yeah, they still sit center stage in terms of due diligence. But um, I think the noise is so heavy on financial and commercial people, uh, sorry, financial and legal, people forget that the commercial due diligence really must sit center stage. And indeed, when we look at the speed of business model changes around us, every 10 years, yeah, a business today will be fundamentally different within a 10 year cycle. The commercial due diligence actually requires that extra lens on, 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 on focus. So it's a brave new world for buyers because of the volatility in the marketplace. Um, and and our, our answer to that is better commercial questions uh, don't just repeat the due diligence uh, uh, questionnaire. You need to really bespoke it to the business you're buying, and in particular around the commercials. And for me, again, passionate about this, who are the customers? Who are the future customers? How do they fit your business model? Um, and I don't think the time has been spent on that. So I'm going to bring Simon in in a second just so that we can choose the fact that some of his experiences with uh, buyers are, and what buyers have done. Oh, I've seen a question coming in as well, so that's good. Um, but a little you know, quick summary for me on acquisitions, uh, and this is really exciting. It's about the strategy. How do we build better businesses through doing better deals? And I think that, you know, step number one is if you're too busy and you're too hands-on in your business and therefore don't know your own strengths and weaknesses and where your business model is going, you can't do this. So step number one, you have to free up time to make sure that you've got, if you like that, working on the business not in its uh, uh, time uh, and and then getting clear uh, which new products new territories new companies new acquisitions you need to buy and why you've got to create the time for that if you don't have that then don't buy it it'll be too risky um and and again i say map out the line of probability for your sector i know i'm asking you to predict the future and i know you can't do that but we can if we look at the direction of travel for our sectors, we can take some best guesses. I liken it to a kettle, actually. Um, that if you imagine the steam coming out of a kettle, the steam very near the end of the kettle, as it spreads out, that's your sector change, you, you can see the direction of travel of that steam. Of course, the further time goes out, the, the less you can see the steam, but you, you get some sense of where markets are going. Um, and therefore try and buy to place your business ahead of the market so it's in pull, not push, and customers are seeking you out rather than you having to persuade them. So what niches do you need to own in order to create competitive advantage um, and be ahead because you can see that's where your future customers are going? I had a, a wry smile yesterday. Uh, the Telegraph uh, were talking about perhaps going into administration and for me, Telegraph was a great, great brand, but they simply have not disrupted themselves enough. They did not succeed in uh, creating a sufficient ancillary services beyond um, the advertising sector and, and, and news. Um, they had great opportunities. Uh, I know that, for example, they launched a will writing service, but just gave up on it. So they just weren't focused enough on how to change their business model ahead. Uh, and the consequences are another big brand in, in, in trouble. So look, what's the data telling you? Where's the business going? How can we buy ahead so that we are meeting the needs of our future customer? Then we go and shortlist those, those potential targets. And there's no problem. I'm also talking about building relationships, talk about building relationships with potential sellers, but also build relationships with advisors and brokers because obviously, being opportunistic to what comes on the market is useful. Uh, and that's generally because those businesses that go to market have decided that they do want to probably do a deal um, uh, and therefore are probably in a better shape to do a deal. Uh, a company that's prepared for sale is an easier deal to do. Diligence, extra lens on commercial. Don't forget that. We did a deal recently, I think it's 45 million where we had I won't mention the name of the firm in case anyone's here, but we had 14 financial due diligence advisors on that. 50 people in the data room. Really? Doing what? It was over the top. Um, 
and actually, again, not enough of the sort of buy side management game. What's the business model here and how are we going to grow this company? So basic stuff in the end. Uh, and if you get that right, hopefully we'll create competitive advantage with the one plus one equals three, which is what we're looking for in acquisitions. So if you remember four corners of M&A, we've got economies of scale, synergy, shareholder value, and really what I've talked about today, positive disruption. How do we buy ahead to place our businesses ahead in, 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 in the marketplace to get competitive advantage? Um, Simon, could I ask that you um, join the uh, session if you can? Hi, hopefully I'm muted now. You are? Maybe you can see you. No, I can't seem to just pressing start. Hopefully we can start video. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and that might help you. What have we got? Or has that just made me ridiculously larger? There we go. Um, yeah, I need, I need your permission to share me. Not that everyone needs to see me, but uh, if you can, then great. Uh, oh, I can't do that. I don't think it's working. Why won't it do that? Okay, you may not be able to see Simon. I'll work on that. You work on that. That's um, fine. I'll, I'll wrap it on for a little bit. I'm probably going to echo a little bit of some some of the same that, that uh, Kevin has already covered. Um, and no doubt you guys will have some questions to... To, to throw at us, uh, which was which is very welcome. I think the, you know, a few things there. You know, missed opportunities. Um, we see a lot. You know, are sort of echoing where we see buyers fall and fail and probably less successful. They fish in very big ponds. Often, we you know when we look at our own database of buyers, we've got buyers on there that, you know, they're looking so wide at, at their targets. Um, Simon, I mean, I've changed you to host. You should be able to do your camera. Okay. You're, 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 you'll be in control now. There we go. Oh. Far away. Right. So, yeah, I think we, we see people fishing very big ponds. I think that's the first point. Um, and they are, you know, we, we named them on our database as Unicorn Hunters. Um, they've been on there for years. They just never quite find the right business that's right. And I think that's because they haven't set out in the first place you know, the right research and strategy. And I think this is where it comes back to being, having a focused strategic um, uh, process. And that really means whether it be the CEO or the MD or the directors that are going to put time in, they need to be able to focus on their market um, and they do their competitive research away from their daily operation of the business. Um, so that they have their, you know, so they're not distracted by being in the business <clears throat> it's very much working on the business and we've all heard that expression many times but it, you know no truer time than when you're looking out the window at acquisition and that means having some dedicated resource and i think you know if you haven't got that at time which many business owners or boards don't have, they, they, they believe they'll find the time they don't really have the dedicated time to, to do that strategic stare out the window where's the vision where's the strategy for acquisition really at um and if you know, and I think that's where external companies can help hugely. We've got blue chip plants that have used Avondale with their acquisition team to go out there and approach companies because they can't do it all by themselves. So I think in the SME market, it's always a struggle to find that that resource. So I think that would be. I think I think that's great, Simon. Yeah. I was going to share with you. I mean, we've got more and more international buyers, but you know, we, yeah. we had a deal the other day where where the international buyer, I mean, they flew in over the weekend. Did that just to meet the team, having nearly agreed terms for lunch. And yeah. we were like, well, who else are you meeting? And, it, and it's sort of, they were a bit weak on that. And basically they'd flown over to do nothing but meet us. Now that's, yeah, that, that's tough. Yeah. Um, I think that it's absolutely right. And I think the, the other thing about approach is when, when you, one does put the time and resource and however that's done, going out there and doing these targeted approaches, you know, once you've done your work you, of research, you know what you want to go after. I think we, what you know, we obviously act quite heavily on the seller's side, and you know we see why sellers like buyers. And I think my advice on the buyer's side would be making sure that we're that we're, we're you know telling the story to the to the seller from a buyer's perspective, selling why you are a good fit for them. Um, you know, sharing your vision and why we potentially could be the right acquirer for your business. In a lot of cases, it could be approaching sellers who aren't quite ready for selling today, but it might be coming up in the next year or two or three, but they haven't done anything about it. 
And it's more than just a knock on the door. It's why would we sell to you? Why would that be a good thing for my company going forward and perhaps my employees, even though there's a shareholder, I might be exiting. At that point, um, you know, that's where they might, you know, it's dressing to impress if you like, but ultimately they might think, actually, if I'm going to sell, these guys might be the right, the right company to sell to. And I think a lot of bars spend a lot of time scrutinizing the seller, um, which of course you want to do, but actually not selling themselves. Um, and there's the difference we have in meetings between bar and sellers that we see. We, we have a meeting, the seller afterwards go, oh, do you know what, I really like those guys or girls, and I think we'll work well together, and I like their vision. That can be the significant difference um, of, of whether they're going to go down the road with you, so regardless of getting to the point of the right offer and structure, which is not what we're looking to cover today. And I think that this is where it comes back to, yep, yeah, spending time with management, avoid talking about just the value of a deal, are you the right commercial fit for their clients as well as the cultural fit for their team? You know, if that culture is right, then then you can begin to pave the way. And just sharing a story on that, um, we had a uh, recruitment company was turned over about twenty million pounds, making about one and a half million pound profit a year. Um, very consistent. Um, it's oil and gas sector. Had about six six or seven staff. So you know, lots of uh, long contracts um term placements rather than uh short-term perm stuff and, and we had several interested parties we had an offer from a blue large blue chip company and the offer was pretty much where we would expect to, to realize and, and it definitely was going to work for the seller the um ceo asked to have a coffee with me um one after they put their offer forward i said yeah that's fine went for a coffee with him and he said what do you think of the offer I know you're not going to give me a yes or a no, but a general feedback. And I said, I think it's in the right area. Um, and he said, what do you think of the, the, the cultural fit? And I said, I think there's a there's a challenge there. And he said, yeah, I, I think it's a potential disaster. Um, what do you think there's any way around it? And, and the simple answer that there wasn't a way around it. The cultural fit, without going into the detail, was significantly different from the blue chip approach. And... And the reality is the blue chip company is too big to change its 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 approach and, and therefore it, it was right for everybody to walk away from that deal which Simon, is... we actually had it we've got a couple of questions coming in please <clears> now <throat> all if you can fire questions in that that'd be great i've got one here from uh, uh adam gentry uh kevin and simon big companies often buy small companies to learn i agree with that and to access innovation uh they wish they'd be able to execute faster um how do you help the seller sme keep their culture when pe firms buy or, or I, i'm going to read that or as in when big blue chips buy once the acquisitions happen and we are seeing blue chip we're seeing a lot of international blue chip buying emerging mid-market businesses you know for them a 10 or 30 million pound deal is low risk they don't want to buy a 200 million one that's high risk but it is harder because they're big and you know you've got this big business buying a small business or with private equity you've got this finance team Account really buying, but you know, can't start starting business. Spreadsheet guys buying a business, you know, there's real cultural, yeah, it's a bit. Um, I mean, one tip I would give to big companies, and I've seen this done and, and advised on it, is don't integrate, buy the small company, hold it at arm's length, learn what your synergies and economies of scale are going to be, let them crack on and carry on growing, learn from them over time. Um, I mean, guys, it always work. I know big, big companies love to. On, on, on integrate but we are seeing that trend um i think yes, um, very much. recently uh we did a security company deal that, <coughs> that was bought by a global american security company that's exactly their plan they're going to leave the small business alone they know if they try and integrate it they're happy out um, I, I, I would definitely echo that i mean we've just done another acquisition we've just completed which you'll know kevin is the water treatment sector and oh, yeah, yeah. you know it's a global company they're based in germany that the, the, the acquirer and our guys are in the uk and um they our guys are largely being left to run that business with their own identity they're not changing the name they will be formed as part of the group um you know so that everybody's aware but they are part of a global company but that i think part of rather than being you know, fully absorbed into um, is the key the key point there. And that's been their approach with many acquisitions around the world um, because actually they, they had shared their story that they had made acquisitions and absorbed them and they had gone wrong for that reason because it was just too much of a shift too quickly 
for management to, and, and they lost good people because they, they, they just couldn't move uh, with the new culture. So I think it's, you've got to look at integration very carefully. And I shared the story of the recruitment because that was one to walk away because they, they were going to absorb them. It was going to have to be their way or the highway. And that was very honest of them. And, and therefore it's right. So I think being prepared to walk away is right. Um, but equally, yeah, you, you've got to look at alternatives for integration, which sometimes it means keeping it at arm's length by, by identity and operation. Actually, what occurs to me here is you've got, with that argument, you've got big companies learning from private equity, you know, buy, hold separate, have an earn out, allow them to continue to grow, you know, but earn out's a classic sort of private equity and, and growth classic private equity play. You know, private equity needs to learn also from big companies. You know, it's not all about the numbers, again, big business model, um, uh, uh, and, and, and how you're going to strategically grow that, 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 that business. So both can learn from each other. And I think they have. Um, and it's really interesting that corporates start to behave more like private equity in that acquisition and strategy uh, work. Um, so I'm got another question. Valuations is critical to strategic deals. What, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? You know, it's an interesting one. Yeah, I, I mean... It's a quite a wide question, that one. Um, uh, you know, I think you're echoing a little bit what you said earlier. I, don't, I think valuations haven't significantly changed, um, if at all, in most good profitable businesses that we're involved with. Um, I think the commercial, uh, sorry, the stru deal structures have become more creative in making sure that um, the risk is, you know, shared. And that's always the challenge. What, it, what is sharing? <laughs> depending on which side of the fence you're sitting. Um, but absolutely, that, that is the biggest change. I'm not, not really seeing valuations being knocked on multiples. And, and, and actually, um, you know, with some of the businesses that are growing and producing very good profits, um, there's no reason that those multiples should be knocked. But with the world the way the world, you know, there's been many challenges, you know, whether we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, we've got, you know, walls around the world. Um, what's next is always the, you know, the big R word is always, you know, leaning across us, all of these challenges. But I think ultimately where businesses are profitable and proven to come through all of those areas and still being profitable and still growing means they're robust and therefore that holds the valuation up. So, yeah, I think structure is absolutely, okay. is absolutely key. And, and there's a good question here from Nick, actually, which is a practical one. Um, NDAs mean, you know, we talk about commercial due diligence and actually understanding the team and culture. But of course, sellers are reticent to, to let buyers meet uh, uh, the team, you know, with an NDA in place. How, how do you get around that if you're a buyer? I mean, that's yeah, thing. it that is a difficult because there is a time and place, isn't there? And I think this is probably where you know a buyer feels more comfortable when there's an offer on the table um uh, sorry seller feels more comfortable when there's an offer on the table and it feels real um but equally they may have their advisor saying you know confidentiality around your staff is is a potential issue um because what if the deal doesn't happen so i think there, there is a time and a place for it i think on a on, on on a buyer's point of view yes you want to be able to do that as early as reasonably possible but you may have to accept that you're going to be spending some time with the senior board first and taking their word for it where what they believe first and foremost about their that their key staff are but echoing the point that once we got to the point of a deal we would want in, as part of early due diligence to then sit down and, and meet that team but also set, again it comes back to setting the point that the reason that you want to do this is is to see that you know that there is a good management team but also hopefully create a better future for them in a lot of cases you know the, the 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 key staff are looking for more and hoping for more um going forward and as a buyer we should be bringing more opportunity to those key staff uh, opportunities going forward so we have lots of cases like that um i've got one at the moment by example we've literally just been engaged actually and the md is not aware of the sale the shareholders are not involved in the business and we've actually just had the conversation. We are going to bring the MD into the loop of conversation um, before we go out to the market so that we're prepared so that, you know, that the, 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 the conversation story had internally, but also um, the MD will, will present himself well and see that it's a good opportunity going forward. So I think it's selling it from a buyer's perspective. It's saying, look, it's probably a good time to bring them into the loop if they genuinely are the key management 
to take it forward. And I think I think the shift actually for me, I mean, I, we wouldn't have got attendees if we'd have called it that. But instead of buy right, it should be invest right. You know, if even if trade buyers are buying and they're, they're holding more separate, in many respects for management, an acquisition is is a great thing if it's done right because they get a much better career out of it and all the rest of it. So if we think of it as investment, then actually we should be less concerned about the confidentiality. So you know. Once we've got the key legals and what have you lined up, then that final three, four, four weeks, then I, I mean, there should really be any reason to stop you getting in and seeing the, the senior team. Um, you know, the seller can turn around and say, look, we're not definitely doing it. Um, we're very clear we've got an alternative strategy. If they don't buy it, then we're going to keep it. It's only going to get more expensive. Um, but, you know, we're exploring it. We'd like you to meet. Let's see how we get on. Yeah, I think that's absolutely bringing them into the mix and making them feel that they're part of almost the decision making process. Yeah. If it's not right, you know, the, the seller can be selling it to the to their key staff. If it's not right, we won't be doing the transaction, which is why, you know, the investment, which is why we'd like to bring you into the loop. And and that satisfies the the, 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 the scenario for the buyer. Yeah. On some of your recent deals, son, one more question we got coming in. Please keep questions coming in. It will be, uh, you know, it's really useful to us and we can all learn from each other. But have we seen a shift between deferred and earnouts? Um, I would uh, say deal structures have increased a bit with, with banks. Yes, yeah, so I think I think that's true. Um, I think the reason that we've seen, you know, we'll say uh, presumably the, the definition there of earnout being, you know, very much performance related payments rather than straight deferred. Um, yeah. I think the answer to that is yes, um, because it's the going back to this mitigation of risk or sharing of risk. How do we do that? Um, you know, and deferred payments. Okay, it, you could have a deferred payment that's linked to an event, um, but if it's linked to an event too significantly, i.e., by performance, then you're then arguably it's, a, it's just a relabeled performance related payment anyway. Um, so I think yeah, I think we're definitely seeing a significant um a number of transactions will have you know the majority of them will have a performance related elements in there um then often a mix though you know i've got one at the moment it's got deferred in it it's got performance related in it and there's some shares being held on in there as well as a sweet equity pot for perhaps future new management so it's got the blend to deal with the the, the, the future going forward yeah but of course if the business is being kept more independent if it is being kept more independent then the sellers are more in control of that event yeah. than, than ever before, um, ideally with less cultural interference. So, so it's not such high risk for the sellers if it's structured correctly, Co as, it, as it was historically perceived. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when they're absorbing your business and they're integrating it and then they cuck it out and annoy all your senior team, that's a disaster, isn't it? it absolutely. We're, you know, Going back to our water treatment business, there's a good example there. It's at the lower end of what we see with transactions. They're, they've received 50% of the completion monies on day one. Now, from a, a lot of advisors, and I'm sure a lot of us say it's quite a lower low proportion, but you know, the, going back to my point of growing businesses and sharing risk, this business uh, has doubled its profits in a year. There's no 100% surety that it will continue to do that, um, but there every, every realism that that can happen, and therefore the, the value is exponentially growing each year. They're on a three-year transaction there, three-year performance-related deal for the remaining 50%. But they are being left to run it. Um, there's a whole load of stuff, which I won't go into now in the self purchase agreement, it keeps them well in control of running it, um, even though they don't have the final say on, on many aspects. But they are exactly that, being left to get on with it and deliver the performance that they've delivered. You know, the alternative is don't sell today and come back to it, but actually that's a worse alternative because they need the resource to maximise the growth and profit opportunity anyway. So it is it is definitely a shared op risk, but also shared opportunity for both parties in that context. Okay. That isn't right for all deals, of course, um, but I, particularly where you've got high growth business, you know, it's got to have the structure in it to minimise you know, minimize the risk from a buyer's perspective, but maximise the opportunity also uh, sell price for the seller. Yeah, so it's so, so structured but correctly, embrace it, don't fight it. But... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's Simon, I've mentioned a lot about due diligence and really I've gone, come on, where's the commercial due diligence, guys? We're forgetting this. Yeah, we're getting caught in all this compliance stuff. Uh, I think that's great on paper. Are you seeing any evidence that people have got the hang of that? Um, uh, when you're saying that, you're meaning whether they're doing more cultural 
Due diligence yeah, well, not just cultural, but you know, who's the customer? Customer due diligence. Um, yeah. About meeting yeah. the team. Yeah. Uh, operational due diligence. How good's the IT? You know, you know really. I yeah. think. What, I think. What's yeah, the yeah, you, you're right. It, it's still very, very bent on the numbers. Um, we've got a, a final slide, I think, that we perhaps can pull up anyway, just to come back to that one in a second. But, but yeah, it's always very heavy bent to the numbers. Um, you know, we do see a lot of deals or a lot of offers not going. We're not. They're not going to go the extra half a multiple on the sale price because the maths on my return on you know my return on capital employees deployed does not quite work on the mass and that's the the you know whether that be the cfo or whether that be the blender them and the accountants and advisors again you've got to get it up you've got to get it for this multiple of five otherwise it doesn't work <clears throat> and actually you're right you know the due diligence should be far greater on commercial cultural um, and many other operational aspects to see what will the profits be in those three years post completion? Because that's where the real multiple is. The multiple today is is a is a financial exercise. Yeah. You know, if we don't get the rest of it right, the maths is is this this maths exercise is exactly just that today. So I think, yeah, we still don't see enough time um, culturally. Absolutely, spending time with management is is weak. And you know, are we are we going to be right for your clients commercially um is our operation going to fit well i think there's very uh very you know, still minimal time spent on those areas in the sme market yeah i know but it's fascinating when you talk about multiple i can remember one deal it was great it was a smaller deal it was a surveillance practice uh uh probably five six years ago where you know the, the buyers we had a number of bids but one of them gone two million that's our final offer Mm. And they were told that they'd lost the deal in the process. And fair play to this company, big company you'd all know. They turned around and said, what's it going to take? Um, let's just say there was another million or so added. And they said, what's it going to take? Because we need Cambridge. And they were right, they needed Cambridge. They weren't there, they needed it. Um, brilliant, they got the strategy right. Uh, and they weren't too embarrassed. They understood that the two million EBITDA and all that was, you know, the finance team and, you know, final offer that was all negotiation gameplay. When, but when push came to shove, what's it going to take? Because they understood, back to sort of Adam's question, they needed the team, they needed the disruption, um, and, and, yeah. and, and, and that drove it. Um, uh, it was quite funny. I think the phone call about the what's it going to take was from some country house where they were doing their blue sky thinking you know, and, and all the guys would turn around and said, we got to do this. And he said, the only place that gets signals the rooftop. <laughs> Which really appealed to me. But, you know, again, that's about don't let the financials kill the deal. Um, we're not asking you to overpay, pay, but, you know, if the market metrics are right, the trends are right, they're adding more customers, they've got the right products, they've got the right team, then you may have to a little bit. You know, a multiple of six versus a multiple of five won't kill. Sam, you did a really good slide on that. So if, if you've got yeah. questions, <clears throat> do we want to share that very quick? I think if you could just share it, yeah, that would be useful. Well, I think. You're, you're a host now, so um, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not where I'm allowed to. Let's it's find on, out. Yeah, I I'll think have a go. you um, should be able to. It's on the back end of the slide deck that you've got. What I'll probably find is I'll, I'll, I'll end up kicking you out. That's host right. disabled. There we go. Okay, let's try that. No, you, you 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 would have to do it. Sorry. Um, right, I don't think I've got access to the slides, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Right, well, well, can you turn off post yourself, Simon? If you did disappear out, and then I'll, I'll put you back on. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with Zoom, Zoom today. There we go. Technology would always disrupt. <laughs> okay. Uh... Yeah, I didn't, didn't think of that one. You got it? Yeah, I'm not sure I can de-host myself. I'll tell you what, we, we'll right. have to we'll have to come back to you. We're going to forward the slides out and, and we're nearly sort of running out of time today anyway. So when the slides come out, it's the final slide deck. Um, but to, to explain the concept, uh, really what, what we were trying to show is that if if, the, if you if you go with the four corners of MA, you've got economies of scale, you've got synergy, 
you've got shareholder value, you've got positive disruption. And if you took an average multiple of, say, five to six um, on, on a price earnings ratio on a, on a target, um, you know, the, the viewpoint is, oh, does that take you, you know, five to six years to pay for it? Because, you know, that, that, you're using the cash flow to, to, to do the deal. But of course, if you successfully get the economy's synergy and the disruption, then what you're actually doing is shortening that cycle to a, a, a three year. So when we look at return on investment and net present value of money, you know, is my money going to work for me? It's actually about not looking at it in, in, in 2D, i.e. In, in, in isolation. It's also about looking at the acceleration to that return on investment. Absolutely. Um, if you get the integration right, um, which I think is a really good theory. Um, so again, you know, if, if if you're the CEO and you want to buy something and your finance team is just, oh, I've seen other comparative deals in a multiple of 5.5, you go, well, yes, but this is not necessarily a comparative deal because this business model is different. And let, let's look at this economy of scale here. Um, and that changes the metrics for, for, for buyers when they're doing their own, you know, internal acquisition uh, uh, present value of money uh, equation. Um, so it's quite important um, and it's a really useful dialogue um, um, and you know obviously many many buyers when they're looking at synergy they say well we're bringing that to the party so we're not going to pay for it uh, but the reality is you are going to benefit from it and, and so we're reversing that argument if there's less good quality companies to buy which there are um, then actually you may need it to, 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 to get the finances to, uh, to, to, to add up so Simon, we talked a lot today. Is there anything that you go, you know what, I can see a real trend here that we need to look at with buyers or, or you know, an absolute, you know, I've mentioned SIMS, so this is a double question, you know, is there, is there any, you know, what, that's a really big buy side mistake that I, I keep seeing and, 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 and we need to warn people about. Yeah, I think I think it's coming back to the thing that we've highlighted the most is spending the quality time with, you know, first and foremost on 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 research, making sure that we've we've got the resource and time to one side. I think that is a key starting point to make sure we're doing the research. We know what what it is that we're after, what we should be targeting out there. Um, but when we do target, the key thing is how buyers present themselves to sellers. So, you know, and by doing that, that then leads into, are we the right commercial and cultural fit for each other? Um, because if you haven't sold your vision well to the seller um, about why we potentially could be the right buyers for you, they won't open up as much. You know, so that rapport building that we see in meetings is very, very variable from one meeting to the next. Um, and, and I do see a lot of, from a seller's perspective, going, well, I'm not sure we're the right fit. And sometimes that, that will be true, but other times it's because they just haven't presented the opportunity of themselves of the acquisition very well, and they're misunderstood. You know, so because the seller doesn't necessarily know much about the bar until they've met them. And they hopefully will walk away knowing a lot more about them and excited by why they're a good company to make an acquisition. So I think that would be my, my biggest point of today would be making sure you present yourself in the best possible way what would you want to hear about yourself as a buyer profile that will just open up the dialogue so much more with the sellers um so, and, and 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 therefore enable you to establish them from both perspectives whether this is a really good opportunity or not you know what you're, you're making me think there i remember that that that, that uh, the, the joke uh, an exam paper What's the uh, the definition of arrogance? And and, and the, the guy responded, not applicable to me. Uh, he fully got it. But but of course for buyers, it's well we're bigger than you. We've got the money, uh, and it's very easy to fall in there for to that. Well, we don't have to justify ourselves. Uh, but actually, really good quality companies that are growing that have the potential to change markets are rarer than people that have already got deep pockets. Um, and that's why you've got a sweetheart. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. And and bearing in mind, you know, it is better to slightly overpay. Nobody's saying get ridiculous, but it is better to overpay for a golden opportunity than yeah. than than get a good deal on something that is only okay. It's only okay. Yeah. Really interesting, Simon. Thank you for your time this morning. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Don't forget, we've recorded the webinar. Um, 
We actually have got some other webinars coming up. I've got a lovely slide that will tell you those, but I can't share the screen. So <laughs> I'm going to talk you through them. Uh, we've got um, an EO uh, meeting. So we've got the Art of Buying and Selling, which is a SEMA webinar, webinar on the 22nd of June. So you have to contact uh, us or SEMA to join that. Uh, 27th of June, we've got uh, Employee Ownership Talk with ThinkCat and the Employee Ownership Association joining in. So that's probably more geared towards sellers that might look at employee ownership as an option rather than just a trade deal. Um, and then 21st, uh, uh, we've got another one on employee ownership. And I would say before the back end of the year, we'll also have another sale uh, um, uh, conference. So uh, uh, we're just working on dates on that. Don't forget to look at our, our website. If you look at our knowledge bank, there's probably 20, 25 webinars now. There's loads of guides and thought, thought leadership articles. Well, we hope they're thought leadership, but insights, research on what's happening uh, in, in, the, in the market today. Any more questions, um, kevin.uphill at avondale.co.uk or simon.baldwin at, at, at avondale.co.uk. Just ping an email. Um, we've talked today about the why, but we're also still happy to go into the how. You know, if you've got a debt-free cash free one you're struggling with or what have you, then we're more than happy to, to, to share our experience and, and, and uh, uh, help you through it. Thank you all for, for listening. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to catching up soon. OK, Simon, you're going to have to end because you're the host. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers.